Um, I'm pleased to be here and it's uh, nice to see a sister organization. I normally work at the Copenhagen School of Global Health, so it's a parallel to the academy here. Um, and I have uh, brought with me one case, um, which is looking at pesticide poisoning, which actually f includes many of the core issues that you would normally think about in a global health case. And I'll come back to that at the end. And uh, in this particular case, if you were to hear about pesticide poisoning, uh, many of you would think about pesticide poisoning as it relates to occupational health, maybe chronic exposure, some may accidents. But in this particular case, I'm going to focus on, on the <coughs> use or misuse of pesticides as an element of self-harm. Is this? It doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Um, just a little bit of background or context. Uh, we estimate that there is an approximate uh, 300,000 death per year, primarily in Asia. Um, and compared to the pie diagram we just saw in terms of maternal health, it's um, close to being the same, uh, let's say, uh, in distribution. So we would have 99% of the cases in, in developing uh, low or middle income countries. And uh, we are, as a context, primarily talking about pesticide poisoning for self-harm as being a, a very impulsive act. And it's very often the easy availability of highly toxic pesticides in the domestic setting that means it makes it a preferred means of self-harm. If I'm going to look at some of the strategies and uh, some I will focus a little bit more upon than others and one that I won't address so much is the strategies that we obviously need to think about in terms of how to reduce, prevent um, self-harm in the first place. So there's a number of social, mental health, um, alcohol misuse, various issues that we would have to address at community uh, level to reduce the problem. Some of these we cannot do much about. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's no, no or not much research into identifying a pill against, um, let's say, love affairs that didn't turn in the right uh, direction, or uh, there will still be unwanted pregnancies or domestic violence issues. So obviously we cannot prevent um, self-harm from happening in total, but obviously the strategies we need to reduce the incidents. But that, that is kind of a strategy on its own. There's also work to be done and lots of work undertaken by uh, Michael and colleagues on medical management. Not my profession, uh, but obviously that plays a role as a strategy in reducing death following self-harm. There's certainly also a strategy that we need to look upon, which is reducing the use of pesticides in the first place, which relates to the occupational, the accidental, uh, maybe the chronic exposures as well, but it also has an impact in terms of self-harm. And we do by now have evidence, uh, one good case is Sri Lanka, where policy of researchers working and documenting the extent of the problem, the nature of the problem, pointing out particular pesticides, um, in communication with media, <coughs> civil society organizations, and not least a very active, bright, um, receptive register of pesticides in Sri Lanka, actually managed to, to have quite an impact on overall death following pesticide poisoning. So, so we do have evidence that the type of agricultural policy, the type of registration policy we have, uh, what we accept to be distributed and sold in the country has a significant impact on the number of cases. And we can also turn that to our benefit from having a more re restrictive policy. This is also a case where global health fe features because production in one country impacts on health in a faraway country. And it's also an issue where uh, global policy standards uh, by UN and others would feature. So we do have some evidence that banning uh, and restricting use has an, has an impact. 
Reducing use of pesticides also from an integrated pest management uh, strategy or from GMOs of plants, reducing the need for pesticide. We don't have so much evidence yet that it will reduce self-harm poisoning, but that's to be explored. About 10 years ago, uh, Michael and others worked on, um, let's say, a, a parallel to the essential drugs list. So trying to argue that how come we couldn't put forward, a, a, let's say, a policy informing users uh, of pesticides, informing extension officers, at a given point in time, we put forward, let's say, on an annual basis, we update our uh, list of rec recommended pesticides to be used based on health effects, effectiveness, cost, and other issues. So we can guide and inform and leave it maybe less for the market and individual farmers to decide what the most beneficial pesticides would be. Financial incentives to reduce toxicity of pesticides is one place where we, by working in India, Sri Lanka, now get some indications from farmers, from district authorities, from agricultural extension officers, that that might be something we should try. When we do farmer surveys, we can see that what influences their choice of brands and, and particular pesticides is very much price, perceived effectiveness, and their access to credits. So is there a possibility that we could guide and control in one way or another um, true market forces and working with extension of government services or maybe private sector? Could we establish credit facilities that would guide the farmers towards using less toxic pesticides? We also have the same uh, in terms of a subsidy. It has worked for products in agriculture. We haven't yet, uh, let's say, established this fact for pesticides. It's a very, um, let's say, huge market, and there are very refined marketing organizations out there. So we would probably have to work in hand in hand with some of the private companies to get these systems in place. Another approach um, we have tried. And this came about basically, uh, let's say, seven, eight years ago. There was quite strong opinions aired from farmers that couldn't we possibly protect their community, their vulnerable young individuals, by locking up or securing a, a more safe access to pesticides. Of course, we know this from Europe also in terms of drugs. We know it from North America in terms of small hand. Um, arms and so on. But there was, uh, let's say, quite an effort made over a period of two years of trying to come up with what would be a safe storage device, a box. So we had four dedicated communities later on, uh, others came on board helping us trying to, to produce or design safe storage devices. The idea being if you at the spell of the moment, your impulsive behavior um, it's more difficult to get access to the pesticides. Um, people will come to your assistance, you'll forget about the episode or something may uh, divert your uh, focus away from the self-harm episode. Believe me, it came to me as a surprise how much you would have to work on something as simple as this. When your first five boxes uh, are being uh, smashed by elephants in the field, or um, you know the key is gone, or it becomes do you call it a bee beehive? You know the, the boxes become very favorite places for bees. There was tons of factors where we continuously had to work with the community. We also tried combination locks, and believe me, a male Sri Lankan, Dane, I'm sure as well, who have been drinking more than four bottles of beer can never recall more than three combinations. So you have to go for four combination block. So practicalities are working with the community. We turn to plastic at the end, and uh, uh, Michael is the proud uh, uh, main, uh, let's say, uh, 
customer of a, a plastic company in Sri Lanka, now producing thousands of plastic containers. That ended up being our favorite, uh, or let's say preferred design in a large randomized control trial. What happened was that the community kind of liked the idea of a safe storage device because it had agricultural benefits, it had benefits in terms of protecting a valuable products like pesticides, but believe me, the pesticide industry also loved the idea. Because you don't have to ban, you don't have to price differently these products, you just have to tell the consumer that they have to lock them up carefully. So it became uh, quite a hot topic within the agricultural, uh, let's say, industry. And they invested significant amount of money in promoting uh, safe storage devices. We wanted to get a word of caution um, across and we want to test whether or not it actually works. We need a randomized control trial to find out if this is an intervention that we should uh, promote as a strategy before the industry takes it over as, um, uh, let's say, a, a possible intervention where they can uh, protect their customers. Because that might uh, reduce the burden on them in terms of some chemical formulations of, or marketing efforts. We also have quite a bit of, uh, let's say, community work to be done in terms of providing the community with, let's say, reducing access to pesticides from private pesticide dealers. Um, and this, of course, becomes more relevant if our safe storage devices actually works, because we're afraid that then people will turn to uh, the pesticide dealers and get pesticides from there. We know this happens from, from certain medicines in Europe, and we have studies in, in Sri Lanka, India, now also coming out elsewhere, that between 14 and 20 percent, even now, without safe storage in houses, get their pesticides from, from private vendors. And these private vendors became the target for a, a small pilot study, uh, 22 salespersons we interviewed, and the vendors don't feel it's their responsibility. Maybe not surprising, but they had all experienced selling pesticides to someone later, uh, misusing it for self-harm. They also knew of people who had died from uh, obtaining uh, pesticides from them. They'd also sent people away whom they didn't trust were actually going to use this for farming. They were quite interested in getting more skills in, in how to avoid selling pesticides. And we tried to discuss with them various kinds of measures to restrict ID cards for farmers, prescription uh, systems and so on. They didn't like this. They would like two things. They would like a system across the board, across all the private vendors, equally saying you cannot sell pesticides to people below the age of 18, for example. And they would like to have times of the month or the year where you couldn't sell it. But it had to be a cross to, let's say, level out uh, competition issues. This is another trial we'll have to do. When you talk to experts, some uh, uh, a colleague of ours have done this, and uh, top of the list of preferred expert opinions of interventions clearly links to bans. And we have documented in a positive impact on, on having a forceful um, implementation of a ban. There are many other ideas that are out there. Most of these haven't really been tested. Some of those have been piloted. But we need more evidence um, to, let's say, recommend the particular strategies. And in this particular case, we need the North part of the globe to work with the South in terms of supporting this research, setting global policies, and we need to talk to private sector, community, government authorities. It's not one silver bullet here, it's a diversity of things, but obviously we need to reduce the most toxic. We need to reduce use. And that would have an impact on occupational, on accidental, on long-term exposure, as well as self-harm. Enough for now. Thank you. <laughs>